All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network webinar series. My name is Jerome Babat, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's uh, webinar series. I'm originally from uh, the Philippines, but in the last five years in uh, Sydney, Australia. And I'm excited to be hosting this uh, session today. I'm pleased to introduce to you the today's webinar uh, speaker, Dr. Jomar Marabilia. Dr. Marabilia is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Queensland. Uh, he obtained his master's and bachelor's degrees in the Philippines. He won a scholarship to do his PhD degree at the University of Queensland. He has a handful of uh, presentations in national and international fora over the, over the last three years. Uh, interestingly, I first met Dr. Marabilia in 2012 during the National Nursing Research Conference in Clark, Pampanga. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, today he will talk about the role of mental health in improving sexual health, reproductive health outcomes. Before I hand the mic over to Dr. Marabilia, I have a few housekeeping items to cover this presentation and the webinar platform. First, today's webinar will be available after the live session and is accessible on YouTube. And next, we'd love to hear from you guys, those who will be joining us later, uh, uh, to uh, give your insights. Joining me also in this webinar is a good friend from the Australian Catholic University, uh, famous lecturer there, Miss Irene Mayo. <laughs> Mayo. <laughs> All right. And last, we'd like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your special or social network, sorry. So without further ado, I'd like to kick things by welcoming our Dr. Marabilia over to you. Dr. Marabilia. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me just to share some of our research findings and just um, some sort of my experience in um, mental health research and its link to um, link with um, sexual reproductive health outcomes in young people. So most of my research, um, it deals with young people's health. And so um, it's, it's really, really interesting to um, explore, I guess, the relationship between mental health and sexual reproductive health. So this webinar does not focus on methodology, um, although I'm an epidemiologist, but I guess I, I, I want more, I, in, during this presentation, I, I want to focus more on the findings and implications of, of our research. So first, I, I want to give you a context of what's happening globally um, in adolescent sexual reproductive health. So in terms of contraceptive use, um, still, Less than twenty percent are um, who are sec less than twenty percent of adoles adolescents who are sexually active are using modern contraceptives, especially in South Asia, um, East Asia, um, and the Pacific. Um, and also, the unmet need for modern family planning is higher, especially among um, non-married adolescents. Now, I got this um, graph from the UNFPA report about adolescent sexual reproductive health in Asia and Pacific. And as you can see here, um, a proportion of females who are married um, are, you know, it's quite still high, um, especially in South Asia, um, in Bangladesh in particular. So it's, 36% um, of our adolescents are married by 18 years old, and 30% are married by 15 years old. And in the Philippines, 13% um, are married um, by 18, and 2% are married by 15. So it means that a huge proportion of adolescents of uh, female adolescents are actually, we can assume that they're sexually active because they're married. Um, and in the Philippines, we can say that um, those, we have around 15% um, of adolescents are married as well. 
here um, in this graph, I want to highlight, I guess, the um, sexual activity before marriage among 15 to 24. And knowing, especially in the Philippines, wherein uh, we have a very conservative culture, um, we can see here that sexual activity um, for male and female um, has equal proportion, so around 10%. But then for other um, contexts, I guess there's a huge disparity between sexual activity, uh, proportion of sexual activity among male and females. And um, generally we can say that more males are sex more male adolescents are sexually active. So these are males. So it's it's quite elevated compared, more elevated compared to females. Now also I have this research that I published in BMC, and I basically look into trends of repeated pregnancy among adolescents. So it means um, this is the prevalence of adolescents who get pregnant again the second time. So it doesn't mean they have kids, um, but as long as they get pregnant again, um, I sort of measure that using the demographic and health survey. So it's a national representative survey in the Philippines. And as you can see after, so I did the statistical test and um, it seems that the trend um, of repeated pregnancy in the Philippines for the past 20 years, um, so from 1993 to 2013, hasn't changed at all. Um, and the prevalence is 18%. So we could say that one in every five adolescents um, adolescent girls are getting pregnant again in the Philippines. And one in every 10 with repeated birth. And again, as I said a while ago, there's a constant trend from 1993 to 2013. Apart from the adolescents itself, um, since they're, they get pregnant and they give birth, another concern in the field is also their children. Um, and in some of my research, we found that um, apart from this adolescents having high risk of pregnancy and labor complications, um, their children tend to have um, high risk of being stunted at 24 months. And I found that this is explained by the poor practice of complementary feeding, or I would say um, infant feeding in general. Now, um, we know that the, in the Philippines, in the Philippine context, um, or even in other low and middle income countries, a, lot, a large number of programs, interventions, efforts has been done. Public health services, public health interventions have been implemented to help these adolescents not to, ha not to have early pregnancy, to prevent early pregnancy, or even um, for them to use um, contraceptive use, uh, for them to use modern types of contraceptives to improve their contraceptive use, and even for those who have who have children, um, for example, in the Philippines, there the government is having partnership with um, um, USAID to help adolescent mothers, early par young parents, to um, adjust and at the same time to to be able to parent their children well. But then, um, according to the Family Planning Summit 2017 in London, it says here that um, popular approaches to promote adolescent contraceptive use or even other sexual reproductive health services um, include, that can be accessed, I guess, through youth centers. And then also even peer education programs. I think this is a very famous um, program in the field of adolescent health are still widely implemented, but then after considering a huge number of evidence, its, it's effectiveness is not much proven, it's inconclusive, and in fact there are research that says that it has no effect on contraceptive uptake and even in, um, in other reproductive health outcomes. Um, education provision of education programs or increasing their awareness doesn't mean that um, in terms of contraceptive use, um, you know, it doesn't mean that there will be a reduction of 
of incorrect use or even the discontinuation rates of contraceptive use um, among adolescents. In fact, um, adolescents tend to use less effective contraceptives um, in those uh, among those who are married, um, a lot of them are discontinuing their COC pills. And also, um, a huge proportion of our adolescent mothers or pregnant adolescents are not accessing reproductive health services despite its availability in their community. Um, we can, this can be evidently, I, I guess, observed in urban setting. Um, we're in, especially for example, in Manila, in the Philippines, um, a lot of um, rural health, um, urban health units, health centers are there. But then if you will look at statistics, there is a very low usage or uptake of uh, reproductive health services, especially in Metro Manila. So there, there's sort of this, I guess, question mark in my head or a lot of question mark in public heads of our program managers in the Philippines. Why, why, is, why despite of um, having a huge number of available services, why are these adolescents still not using contraceptives or even accessing um, a lot of services available in their health centers? And I guess um, a lot of a lot of interventions focus on just providing education and having this sort of framework that as long as we gave them education, we have this assumption that they will straight away use a contraceptive method or we can assume that they will straight away go to um, their nearest health center. But then, especially in this group, we tend to forget that um, they're in the crucial stage of their life or developmental stage. And I guess, um, their um, cognition is still being developed. Um, they need some guidance and, and assistance, I guess, in how they facilitate decision-making in their health. And we, as, as public health um, professionals or even nursing professionals, we tend to forget the, the psychological aspect of things of, of these adolescents in terms of sexual reproductive health. We forgot that there might be some link or linkage um, linkages between you know their actual use or access of services um, and and that the the information that we're giving them you know those promotion those um, those promotion activities that we're giving them so there there should be I guess my hypothesis here is just um, there could be a missing gap between that those two sort of um, endpoints that we want for these adolescents to to achieve, um, and so I thought of mental health. Um, that probably, perhaps, mental health or psychological well-being of these adolescents can actually um, modify or impact the way they actually process the information they receive from health professionals, from their community health workers or barangay health workers. Um, and so, it's important for us to I, to to explore this. Um, this mechanism that's happening in their head. And, um, and you know, mental health um, problems or disorders is quite prevalent, it, even um, in, in some sectors or in, in some population groups, um, mental health disorders is quite prevalent among adolescents in comparison to adults. And in, in fact, um, one in every two adolescents either if, if, regardless if they're boy or girl, experience uh, any type of mental health problems. And, I, and in my opinion, this is even an underestimate because most of research, um, they, they were only using hospital data, um, clinical data, and in, in which you know, this information could, could be a, the worst form of mental health already and not actually um, capturing those mild form of mental health problems or disorders because adolescents don't really go to a health facility um, or, as, or a clinic just to have their mental health assessed. These prevalences could be even higher among those um, vulnerable groups, especially those who are school dropouts, not finishing their education, those who are 
under who are using illicit substances or even having some alcohol disorders also even nowadays that cohabitation is um or i would say living in together de facto relationships quite common nowadays among our young people you know intimate partner violence gender-based violence those who are experiencing this um this type of situation or who are in this type of situation could have um higher um higher chance of experiencing mental health problems and lastly um who have fami family dysfunctions um who are whose parents are separated or if they're in a foster care um in you know in australian context um, those who are in a foster care setting and not living with their parents or having, I guess, in general, a dysfunctional family, um, we can expect that mental health problem could be experienced by these young people. Okay. In the Philippines, um, according to the Philippine Statistics Authority, mental health could be the third most prevalent form of morbidity. I say could be because we don't have enough data in the Philippines to, to have a definitive estimate about mental health problems. Uh, but then they have sort of a measure of disabilities, people who, are, who have disabilities, and it's 14%. Um, according to World Health Survey, um, which was done in 2005, 14.5% have depression, but only 14% have received screening in the past two years. So among those who are depressed, only around 14 or 10 percent of the pop of of this group who have been diagnosed are actually screened before they were diagnosed um, also a recent qualitative study found that filipinos who have mental health problems tend to have internalized stigma and um, this prevented them to actually seek more help um, or even access different services around their community and lastly, uh, family and community stigma, of course, um, can also cause not just, you know, can, cannot just prevent, um, prevent these people with mental health problems to access the services, but worst cases, they can even further, can, they can cause further distress among these uh, patients. And so it's quite complex in the Philippines. Um, there, again, there's internalized stigma, which definitely is a main problem because if the patient or the, or the person itself has this sort of internal conflict, what, what would you expect them to, to access services or talk to someone? Um, and I guess that's, that's the reason why suicide is quite high nowadays in the Philippines. And this estimate, just to, to let you know, these are in, um, this talks about general population. This, because we don't have any data about adolescents. Now, in my study, um, good thing we have some data we could use in the Philippines. Um, I'm using Cebu Longitudinal Attrition Survey. Um, this is a three-generation cohort, so it means that they measured the first generation of individuals and their kids. They measured variables or measures in their kids and also the kids of their kids, um, which is quite interesting. Um, but then in my study, I focused on the second generation, we call them index children, um, and um, we analyze or analyze data using their 2000 to 2005 and 2007 data. Um, and this survey is quite good because of its low attrition. So the, the retention rate, um, uh, of individuals who are in this longitudinal survey is quite um, high um, relative to other surveys even done in but even those surveys who are which are done in um, America um, even here in Australia and also in the UK I was able to get 453 male and female or analyze 453 male and female adolescents um, who are not pregnant at the time of the survey or who haven't impregnated someone for males. Um, and then all the measures or variables I use are self-reported, which has its limitations. But then um, I guess if you look at, uh, look at the questionnaires using the survey, they were able to cross-check it. So um, they, they did what the best that they can uh, for the survey. 
And I use um, I use a depression scale to assess the the, um, the severity of their depression. Uh, but then in this case, I only dichotomize it or categorize it into two. So if they're depressed or not depressed, because we have very low sample size. Um, but then this is a 16 item scale. It's validated for um, cultural and even language differences because the the depression scale used, which is the Center for CESD, um, um, it's originally from the U.S. It's it's used in the U.S. context, and so this survey um, modified it so that adolescents can understand what this, you know, all those statements in the scale mean. And the cut of course is ten for this. Um, also, I, apart from the survey, I look into different research papers in low and middle income countries. Um, so I meta-analyze um, all the estimates I, get, I got from research papers um, and have this pooled odds ratio or pooled estimate just for us to have a consensus of what the, the evidence is telling us. Um, and I use some software, um, softwares to to analyze my data. Um, and I basically use this model, so random effects, quality effects model. So basically this incorporates um, the publication bias and even the quality of the study um, in pulling the effects or the estimates found from each study. So just to share some of our findings, um, about the influence of depression and to um, reproductive outcomes. So for family planning use trajectories among young people, we found that those who are depressed at 18 years old tend to not use consistently at age 21 and 24. So, and they are 3.36 times more likely to have this consistent non-use. So if they're depressed, we expect them not to really use contraceptives um, during their young adulthood stage. And also, um, those who are persistently depressed at 18 and 21, um, they tend not to use contraceptives at age 21. So as you can see here, um, we could say that um, those who are depressed as early as 18 years are three times more likely not to use contraceptives during their young adulthood. And this is regardless if they're married or not, or they, you know, if they have a partner or they don't have a partner. Now, this is some of my preliminary findings. I'm still analyzing it further, but I just want to share this as well to all of you. Um, so as of this stage, I'm only comparing the prevalence of uh, or pro not proportion of young mothers who are accessing prenatal care, started prenatal care at first trimester, and all these type of outcomes. So I compared the proportion of the, of of that sort of outcome in um, between depressive and non-depressive um, young mothers. And as you can see, um, for access to prenatal care, uh, um, it's lower among depressive young mothers. And most of them um, don't really start their prenatal care at first trimester. And if you will, I, because I don't have much time to, to show it and explain, um, I was able to um, look into the proportion of those who started prenatal care um, in every month. So it's disaggregated actually by month. And um, those who are non, non um, those who are depressive tend to only start seeking prenatal care around fifth to six months of their pregnancy, um, which is uh, quite late already. Now for breastfed infant, again, the definition of this is just, you know, if they are breastfeeding the infant or not, um, it doesn't mean if it is exclusively breast, if it is an exclusive breastfeeding. But then the fact that they're, if they're just breastfeeding the infant or not, um, nine, it's a little bit lower, again, um, for not for depressive young mothers, so 96.7 percent compared to non-depressive, which is 98 um, percent. And then for complementary feeding, introduction of solid and semi-solid food, um, we found that 
um, only 60% um, among depressive mothers are actually doing this for their children compared to non-depressive, which is 71.4%. But then I guess my comment on this is in general, regardless if this depressive, non-depressive, young mothers still has, um, you know, a, a quite low proportion of young mothers are doing complementary feeding um, to their children during infancy. Now, I also look into depression um, as uh, a predictor for um, repeated pregnancy or occurrence of multiple um, recurrence of pregnancy among um, young people and what I found after meta-analyzing or compiling studies which talked about this sort of relationship I found that um, depressive adolescents actually have 40 46% risk of getting pregnant again so more or less 50% risk um, so we it's quite high knowing that we have this sort of assumption that once they get pregnant for the first time, you know, um, some people would say they should have learned um, sort of their lesson or even, um, you know, be more familiar with different reproductive health or contraceptive services. But then there's, there are still uh, a huge portion of adolescents are getting pregnant again because they're depressed. And the risk, 46%, 46% of that risk is attributed to depression. Um, and, you know, I, this, this slide, I just want to, I guess, highlight how um, the, 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 the possibility that most of these adolescents or young mothers are actually depressed. And as we all know, most of the pregnancy in young mothers are unintended, are unintended, especially in the Philippine context. And um, those who have an unintended pregnancy actually are 2.36 times more likely to be depressed. So um, we are really expecting that these adolescent mothers, since they have most probably unintended pregnancy, tend to be depressed by 2.36 times. So it's, I, it's avoidable, but then we could say that's inevitable because of the nature of the pregnancy, the type of pregnancy, the intendedness of the pregnancy. And I guess to make it more complicated, even the fami familial influence um, of, for this adolescent, especially in the Philippine context, it's very inevitable that adolescents could be diverse. Now, what can we do? as nurses, and these are some of my thoughts. Um, screening in primary care is really, really important for adolescents. Let us not just provide education and services. Let's look into, let's assess their mental health um, status. Um, we have a lot of screening tools that we could use. Um, holistic case management as well. We need, when we deal with a patient or a young person, we need to look into the different aspects of their lives, because as you know, nurses, even, I just would like to share, here in Australia, um, we, we have this research on domestic and family violence, and we interviewed some patients, and they're saying that they tend to open more to nurses um, in a primary care setting compared to a doctor. Um, and so nurses have really um, a huge role in this, um, you know, in this field of mental health. Um, then last thing is promotion of mental health and community, de community development. You know, in community health nursing, we need to navigate all the possible um, key players um, to, to really avert the different uh, um, worst outcomes of mental health. Um, and I just want to share this um, diagram from this qualitative study by Tanaka. Um, they found that, you know, Again, it's a, because in the Philippines, mental health is still a stigma, but then for us to modify that or avert that sort of uh, phenomen, phenomenon in the Philippines, we need to um, look into peer bonds, peer groups, navigate their peers, um, support based on the Bayanihan spirit. Again, it's very community support, um, social network within the community. 
and fatalistic appraisal of stigma experience. So this, they define this as more the religiosity of the person. So faith, faith-based interventions, spiritual care nursing definitely is useful in this, um, in, in this field of research. Now, um, so again, just to highlight screening, early detection of mental health is key. As you can see, as early as 18, um, um, it could already influence the way they think about reproductive health services. And even evidence said um, in other countries that mental health could start as early as 14 years. But then we don't have data um, about, met about the mental health of these young people at age 14. But then as early as 14 years old, we can already screen for mental health because it's mental health problem starts at that young age. Um, Integrate mental health screening at service delivery points. Uh, we have we can do it in school, community, and even in teen centers if we do have it in our areas. Um, there are short screening. There are screening tools that we could use. Um, some of them are five items. Some of them are ten items. Um, I think for postnatal depression, we have a ten item scale that they could use. Um, specifically for pregnant pregnant women. Now for case management, I guess I want to highlight first that we need to improve the attitude of our nurses. You know, when there's a teenager saying that um, there's something something happening in their family, they need to emphasize. They need to have that emphatic relationship, that that sort of attitude that will not that would sort of prevent adolescents to open up. Um, it's really really important for us to improve the communication um, the communication styles or the way nurse interacts with patients. Also family involvement. Um, excuse me, family health, family, family health nursing then comes in into case management of a young person. So um, because that, who knows, maybe this person is experiencing um, um, gender-based violence at home or even there are things that this adolescent cannot open up to their parents and so definitely involvement of par parents, siblings or even I guess in the Philippines since we have a very extended family structure you know grandparents as well or aunties and uncles. Navigation of mental health and other services available. I know in the Philippine context that we only have very few psychologists. Um, but then I guess the nurse, community nurse or school nurse must know when to refer a patient. You know? I mean, apart from in, um, increasing the capacity of our nurses in this primary care setting to be able to manage um, in their own capacity people with mental health or young people with mental health, they should also know when to refer, where to refer, um, you know, welfare services. And it's not just about, I guess, referring them to, um, to, to psychologists, but even, you know, if the trigger of their stress or depression is that they can get into school, um, definitely maybe we can look into how health and education sector can talk. Um, and then police as well, you know, um, again, for those other sensitive issues or um, sensitivities that these adolescents are experiencing. Um, I just want to share here one review, a um, meta-analysis I did about the effectiveness of community health workers in preventing repeated adolescent pregnancies. And we found that, you know, deployment of community health workers actually reduced the risk of of adolescents repeat pregnancy by 30%. And upon looking into the different programs um, or different roles that community health workers um, are doing, they actually have incorporated mental health aspect, parenting um, in their intervention. Um, and these community health workers, um, this even includes um, um, nurses as well. So I think, I'm, I just want to highlight in this slide that nurses can do um, something to be able to um, really help adolescents cope with their stressors, especially young mothers. And this is proven to be effective. Now, I just want to share too, lastly, um, 
a review that we are currently doing, I'm currently doing with SEU, or Eastern University. So we're reviewing 11 research articles about mental health integration um, in low and middle income countries. And the service providers included um, in this review are community workers and nurses and midwives, because we want to contextualize it in the Philippine context, the availability of community workers, nurses and midwives. And I guess in general, um, most of the programs that we found in low and middle income countries, which are proven to be effective, addresses maternal mood. Um, so right there, in, right there at point of contact, um, they were able to provide some first uh, mental health first aid, um, or even that therapeutic communication um, with um, depressed mothers. Um, also, they were able to encourage support from the family, so they further expanded the role of nurses from patient care um, and expanded it to um, their families. And then, emphatic relationship and also parenting sessions. They, 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 they found that having parenting sessions is important because they have a, they have a new member in their family. They, the adolescents have, uh, adolescents have um, a baby, and so parenting would sort of alleviate their stress about parenting. Um, establish and navigate social networks. So again, peers, community groups, if they're available. So this composes, uh, these are basically the key features of um, effective interventions we found in this review. Um, and so from, from, I guess, this last point, in the Philippine context, it's it's important to, pr to promote mental health through youth community groups. I mean, we have our SK group in the in in different barangays in the Philippines, and I think they could be navigated to just promote mental health and increase awareness in the community. And usually, nurses have sort of the energy and and the passion to do this um, in 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 the Philippines. Uh, now, for future research. I guess, you know, although this is a bunch of evidence, a bunch of estimates that I've presented, again, it has its own limitations. Um, my findings is only applicable in the Cebu context, since the, the service um, conducted in Cebu. Most of my reviews, uh, all of my reviews doesn't have any studies from the Philippines, um, which is quite um, a shame, but then it gives us you know, a, a red flag that we need to do such research in the Philippines. We need to look into triggers of depression or mental health in different ecological levels. I guess most of the evidence now are focusing on adolescents. And so uh, I guess to, to, to expand the scope and even um, the robustness of, of the evidence, we need to focus on looking into the family of adolescents, different factors in the family, family level, if they have partners as well, and even at, um, among their peers. Um, also, we need to look into different predictors of mental health and sexual reproductive health across life course. And I want the, the reason why I, I put out this figure is just to highlight that um, you know for ad for adolescents. Um, apart from the societal, community, and familial factors, you know, their experience as an infant or even as a child, um, and different, um, I would say, crisis they experience at, at these stages impact the way they behave, the way their brain is structured, the way they see work, the world, I guess. And so it's important to look into other predictors that have happened in the past. And this is only um, possible if we will do a prospective or retrospective studies. Um, as we know, most of the studies in the Philippines are cross-sectional. I mean, it's good. Um, it could give us huge amount of evidence, but then for us to move forward, for us to be able to analyze more high-level predictors or more robust predictors, we need to, I guess, design a more, um, um, I hate to say this, more complex studies, but then studies can, that can actually detect um, important variables for these adolescents. So um, also, um, 
we have a in the Philippines, um, we have a lot of big data in the community. It's just that it's not recorded in the cloud that we could access it. Um, perhaps we can look into the different big data existing in the community in the Philippines and look into also opportunities to um, influence the data systems and include mental health screening. Because if you will go to a typical barangay health clinic or barangay health center, they would have paper-based recording. Um, they would have some tools. Um, and so regardless if it is paper-based or electronic-based, if there are, um, those data systems um, could be used as platforms to introduce mental health screening. Um, and so, um, and, and once these sort of data systems are established, then, you know, I guess this is an opportunity for us to analyze this big data because if you if you will go to a health center, this information are just stored in a cabinet, and that's it. Um, it's not being much utilized uh, for research. Also, social media and data analytics. Um, just want to share this as well. I'm currently doing a research on um, social media, so I'm using social media information or data to actually analyze or pr produce sort of a rough prevalence of suicidality um, in UK and US um, and even in Australia. And I think since a lot of young people nowadays in our country are using social media and even use social media to air out their feelings, to verbalize what they're thinking or verbalize what's happening in their family, in their community, we can actually use that to, to look into you know, what, what these adolescents are thinking. Um, social media data analytics is a huge, huge um, uh, platform for research. Lastly, we need localized and accessible interventions. Um, so it needs to be, we need to develop interventions that are, that are highly transfer, transferable in the Philippines. Um, as we know, we cannot just get some intervention in America or Australia or US uh, or UK and then just put it, you know, implement it in the Philippines. We need to make it localized. As you know, we need to look into culture as well. Um, and integrated collaborative care models. As I highlighted a while ago, it doesn't only include health. Um, it doesn't only concern the health sector. We need to look into education as well, um, or even um, welfare as well, because these adolescents tend to have much complex problems in their lives, and we cannot just deal with their mental health. We need to do have we need to have a, a holistic case management approach. So before I end my presentation, I would like to thank um, University of North Carolina um, Life Course Center um, for funding my research and FEU just for helping me with those systematic reviews. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess if you have questions, uh, um, I'm open for any questions. If you have. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Jomer Marabilia. We will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Uh, would like, before that, we'd like to acknowledge Dr. Richard Sullivan, Assistant Professor uh, from the Central Mindanao University in the Philippines. Okay, he will be joining as an observer at this, at this stage. Um, yeah, it looks like we have we have one question on my Facebook inbox. Okay, we have a question for Dr. Marabilia. Okay, it's good that you mentioned from from James of Cebu. Okay, uh, it's good that you have mentioned about screening in the in the uh, public health centers. How is it possible that we can access these uh, screening tools? I under, we, we understand, his question is, we understand that the screening tools are widely available, but these are not, these are not uh, adopted in, in the Philippine setting or, yeah. Um, I guess I, I, you know, if we have, for this, for example, for this survey, um, they have this tool that they use um, as it's culturally appropriate in the Cebu context. Maybe we could use that. 
Um, but then yes, I know that a lot, there are a lot of tools available. You can download it online. But the problem is, is it appropriate in the Philippine setting? And so, um, we don't have any tools as of the moment. I, uh, um, um, I'm not aware of, I guess, any screening tools um, that, mm -hmm. that can be used at the primary care level. But then, I guess, this calls for, you know, research of about adapting these tools, and we're actually doing that in the EU. We're developing um, a, a research with the psychology department in FEU to be able to culturally adapt some of our tools, methods, screening tools, and. Yeah, we keep okay. you updated, but then, yes, it, we don't have one in the Philippines. We don't have any um, tools that is um, adapted in the Philippine context and that calls for research. But there are tools that you can download online. Mm. All right, okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Jomer. I'd like to have a question, Irene? Yep. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think that's really great, and it's a, it's a way to really think about what's needed next after you've done the systematic reviews. I'm just curious about the practicalities of things we can do now. Um, how are nurses now trained on mental health first aid? Because I know here in Australia, we have a program for our undergrads. Do they have... Mm. All right, yeah. go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, I can only speak in behalf of what's happening in FEU. <laughs> um, I mean, they're trained in, in, in FEU, they're trained on how to um, deal with, with people who have mental health problems. But in terms of those first aid, it, it's a different skill, I guess. It's, it's, beyond, it's beyond, you know, that clinical care, um, clin you know, those conversations that you have in a psychiatric ward. Um, I'm not much aware if our nurses, undergrad nurses, are trained on how to do mental health first aid. But then because when I was talking to some of my colleagues in FEU, they're actually keen to, to, to be trained um, on mental health first aid. So I'm assuming that there's no much awareness about doing this kind of um, stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess the, the way is, you know, maybe, yeah, integrated in the curriculum. Um, but reinforcing that, and I, I think with mental health first aid, it's, it's important, especially in the community setting, yep. um, those who are doing community nursing. But yeah, I, I think it's, it's not much integrated into the curriculum. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I think um, it's good that the background information yeah, it is quite unfortunate that most of the research is from other countries. Mm, uh, yeah. I think there, yeah, there is, there is some areas. Uh, what are some of the barriers to having this type of research in the Philippines? Is it funding? Is it, is it stigma? Is it not a priority? Or I think nowadays, uh, I'm not sure if Sir Richard has comments as well, but I think mental health, in the Philippines um, is quite a it's sort of the flavor of of the year as of the as of the moment in the health sector. Um, but yes, there's there's a difficulty in accessing funding. Um, it requ it requires a considerable amount of funding when doing this type of research. Yep. Um, and also, I guess um, in terms of ethics. You know, because we have very, mental health is very stigmatized as of this stage in, in, in the Philippines. And so this, we need to be very, very careful in designing our research, in interviewing our respondents. So ethical considerations needs to be really be articulated, stipulated, which is a very big challenge for researchers back in the Philippines. But then um, I, I definitely acknowledge that there are people who are equipped on how to do this type of research, but then it's more of first funding, of course, and also to accept the, the, the not, I wouldn't say acceptability of this type of research, I guess the interest, not just at the national level, mm -hmm. um, but then among the local, as yeah. well, local leaders, um, 
So, I mean, we have this research, uh, we're building sort of a protocol for doing these kind of things. Um, and I guess I want to share that. Uh, yeah, I guess I think I'm okay to share this. So we are utilizing our nursing students um, in FEU. We're planning to, so we're applying for some funds for that. Um, but then our plan is actually to utilize nursing students who are doing um, their community um, exposure in the Philippines. And because, you know, when they're they, in, in FEU, when they're exposed in the community, they actually collect information. Mm -hmm. and, they, and if FEU has good sort of, or if a school has a good tie with that community, every year they would sort of visit that sort of community with different set of students. And I, I, we will sort of use that platform to collect information um, on mental health in other community services. So, um, yeah, I guess we, we can utilize our students um, to be able to help us collect that data, but it's about thinking those, thinking about um, different strategies on how, how we can make it cost effective. So I, I guess that's my, my, my right. bottom line is just, you know, we're also thinking of cost effective ways of collecting information. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, I think he has to uh, raise a point from the previous uh, topic that uh, Iron has mentioned. Thank you. I hope you can hear it. It's yes, really yes. loud out here. <laughs> so, yes. Um, uh, I would just like to thank you for a very informative presentation of the question. Um, I, I do think that this is really a valuable I know, uh, uh, contribution to the, um, to the uh, health and mental health um, in, the, in the Philippines. No? But I would like to ask if ever... Um, how do you plan to implement this in in the Philippines or like um, I, I know that I, I know that uh, in the Philippines it is really hard to to implement such uh, valuable information. Uh, it's not about the stigma, but more likely the lack of like uh, the lack of a system wherein uh, depression can be detected easily or even support groups. We have support groups, but we, we, um, I do think that it is um, more likely uh, not really integrated to all of the health systems in, in the Philippines. There, 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 are, there, are, there are structures, but if, um, I, I do intend that how, how, can we, how can we connect this or to link all of this into a system where we can help more de depressive patients or depressive um, individuals. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thank you, Sir Richard. That's really, really true. Um, it's a very systemic sort of issue. It's not just about, you know, we have a problem in our... Uh, we, it's not just, I guess, one sector's problem, and I think it's important for us to first, um, well, you know, people would say let's involve everyone, but I think in in my own personal in opinion, um, it's about testing different models. It's about looking into the feasibility of different strategies on how to do it. Because, and let's start in. I, my strategy now I, as, as a researcher, because I came from a national, I work in the national office of the Department of Health, and, I've, and also I work in the grassroots level sector. Um, and I think it's important if we, if we want to make a change, let's start at that sort of community level for us to be able to generate more pragmatic evidence about how for example, screening. I don't think it's just screening that would sort of uh, improve practice in the community setting or even in clinical setting. Um, but there are different strategies. But then for us to be able to, to, to know if it is adaptable, if it is effective, we need to test it. We need to do more research. But then again, the challenge is where do we get our funding? Where do we get resource on how to do these kind of things? Um, my, my suggestion is for us to partner with local officials, there are 
for example, um, what I'm doing right now is I'm partnering with Navota City in Manila, and they seem to be very, very interested in mental health. And once you get that sort of agreement or support from their lo your local leaders, then you can talk about support and funding. And if, let's say, you're working in a community, then or you're working in a university, then that's, that's the start of that kind of partnership. Um, so I guess it's the solution here is not just us as academics to work on our own, but even to also partner with local groups um, or even the system, the public system itself, you know, um, um, as small locality and implementing strategies that we can think is effective or strategies that we think are effective. Um, so for me, I guess it's, it's about testing different models because we, we won't know what is effective if we test those kind of um, ideas that we have in our heads. Um, for example, in this mental health screening, um, we are thinking to pilot this in, in some sites in Manila. So we're applying for funding in the Philippines because most of the funding here in Australia is quite scarce in terms of developing country to do research in a developing country context. I'm not sure if Irene can agree on that. But then, um, yes, we are looking for funds to, to test that. But then, apart from again, apart from seeking funds as researchers or as academics, we need to also partner with local community. Otherwise, what we're trying to do here, what the research that we're trying to do will just end as, as data or as an evidence. So, um, yeah, if you want the impact system, we need to partner with the system. We need to partner with the leaders. We need to partner with the community um, to make a change. Especially this is mental health. It, it's, it's very complex, you know. It's, it's, it's very clouded. You need to partner with education if you want to, to, to help students. You need to partner with universities as well. You know, especially a huge number of cohort of young people are now in the university or colleges. We need to partner with um, out-of-school youth groups as well if you want to reach that sector. Um, maybe if you even want to tap other population groups, senior citizen groups, or um, one of my colleagues are targeting, you know, those tricycle association mm -hmm. or diverse association as well when they're doing this type of intervention. So as academic research also, I, researchers, I think, or academics, we can learn from NGOs, from non-government organizations on how they partner with local groups. And so we can sort of use those strategies in implementing our research. Because nowadays, um, especially for funders, um, funders doesn't look into, just look into the, the, the robustness of, of a research, but, but even its sustainability. Um, so yes, partnership, I, I guess it's partnership. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for raising that very important issue on funding and robustness of evidence from, from the funding's uh, perspe funders' perspective. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions or perspective? It looks like we've covered all of our questions. Dr. Jomer, is there anything else you wanted to cover up before we wrap up? Um, just... I guess, um, I, since I'm an advocate of mental health, um, not just for young people, and as a researcher, I, I, I really want to say that we have low amount of evidence in the Philippines. And so anyone who's interested to talk about how we can collaborate and I, I develop sort of a research or even programs, um, not just in the Philippines, but even in other contexts, feel free to contact me. I'm definitely interested to help you out. That's All it. right. Okay. Mm, but great. Thank you very much. You, we appreciate you being here, Dr. Jomer. At this juncture, I would like to thank the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network for uh, organizing this event, Better New Delta Nursing Society, Nursing for Humanity, Dr. Jomer Marabilia, Dr. Richard Sullivan, and uh, Irene Mayo. Okay. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Uh, thank you, guys, offline for a debriefing. Thank you.